Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming today's distinguished speaker, Professor Eugene Kandel, CEO of Startup Nation Central. <laughs> Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, Professor Kandel, MEI Chairman Bilahari Kasukan, members of the diplomatic community, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth SR Nathan Distinguished Lecture organized by the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore. I am pleased to now invite the Acting Director of the Middle East Institute, Ms. Michelle Thieu, to kick off the afternoon's proceedings with her welcome address. Ms. Thieu, please. Minister, Professor Kandel, Chairman and Board Members, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Middle East Institute's 2019 SR Nathan Distinguished Lecture. I also want to welcome Minister Vivian Balakrishnan. Many of you know him as our Foreign Minister, but Minister Balakrishnan is also the Minister in charge of Singapore's Smart Nation Initiative. Minister, I'm very glad you were able to join us this afternoon. This year, we are very pleased to have Professor Eugene Kandel deliver our lecture. For those of you who have joined us each year, you will know that this year we've decided to take a slightly different tack and address an issue that is not directly political, but could, in the medium to long term, have a transformative impact socially, politically, and even culturally. In doing so, we have not moved far from the original purpose of these lectures, named after our former president, and for those of us currently or previously with the foreign ministry, also a much esteemed permanent secretary and ambassador. Mr. Nathan had always believed that we needed a deeper understanding of the Middle East. For us at the Middle East Institute, this deeper understanding has meant that we must look beyond politics and economics and hear from those eminent not just within academia, but also in business, journalism, the arts, technology, and the sciences. Professor Kandel has often been called the father of Israeli innovation, and we welcome him today. He is the CEO of Startup Nation Central, a nonprofit dedicated to strengthening Israel's ecosystem, and more importantly, connecting business, government, and NGO leaders across the globe to people and technology in Israel, so that together they can seek solutions to their most pressing problems. The Emil Speyer Professor of Economics and Finance at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Professor Kandel has been widely published for his work into financial markets and financial intermediaries. His research was also instrumental in the 1997 redesign of Nasdaq's trading rules. Before we hear from Professor Kandel, please join me in welcoming our minister, Minister Balakrishnan, to make a few remarks before Professor Kandel speaks. Minister. Thank you. I'm here first to welcome Professor Kandel to Singapore. Um, let me very briefly try to tell you why your presence here uh, is salient. First, although you're, you're called the father of Startup Nation, uh, having been to Israel, I'm always reminded Israel dates its history in terms of millennia. And I think the first temple on Temple Mount probably 3,000 years ago. Independent Singapore, only 54 years. So if, it is, if you're talking about smart, a start-up nation, actually Singapore should qualify, simply because we are such a recent invention. The next point I wanted to make is that although I'm the foreign minister, uh, my real interest is really about the impact of technology on politics and in turn, the way domestic politics interfaces internationally with world events and diplomacy. So let me put, up, put one hypothesis to you, that all the major leaps in human history, whether your frame of reference is in terms of thousands of years, or centuries, or decades, are really punctuations due to inflection points 
when technology supervenes. So let me give you an example. We're all speaking English today, not Hebrew, not Russian, not Andrin. Because the Industrial Revolution began 250 years ago in England and spread across to Europe, and ultimately, the ultimate beneficiary of the Industrial Revolution has been the United States of America. So what happened in these 250 years? The people, the businessmen, the politicians, the countries where the Industrial Revolution began, the people who mastered these technologies amassed disproportionate economic power, which in turn translated to military power, and in turn led to their ability to colonize most of us out in Asia. And Asia's biggest failing in the last thousand years was the fact that we missed the Industrial Revolution. So the first point here is that technology matters. It gives you disproportionate advantage. And in the early phase of a technological revolution, the few tycoons, the few people who get it, become disproportionately wealthy. It takes a long time for these same technologies to be democratized, for the fruits, the harvest, to be spread more evenly. And then you get a rising middle class, and then you get a golden age, and then you get a decrease in inequality. A lot of the angst, both domestically and internationally right now, is also focused today on inequality. My thesis is that it is not some right-wing conspiracy that is at the heart of growing inequality today. It is because we are again in the early phase of yet another revolution, and this time it is the digital revolution. And that's why today you have a new class of digital oligarchs. If you want to name them by companies, banks, right? Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, Netflix, etc. You can name the individuals, the founders, those are the billionaire classes of this modern day. And if you think that data is the new currency and the new source of power, you also know that data is very unequally distributed and the ability to use it and the political and social impact of that is also very unequally distributed. We have not yet reached the age of maturity where all the tools of this new digital revolution have been commoditized, have been democratized, and it will need that second step to occur before we can regress the growing inequality which we witness all around us today. So which brings me to my third and I hope my final point, which is why smart nation. Because Singapore is so small, and because we are so dependent on the rest of the world, if we are not ahead of the curve, ahead and able to surf the way, we will be lost under the tsunami of this new revolution. So that's why Prime Minister Lee Sen Loong insisted that we need to boot up again our operating system. And Smart Nation is actually a deeper, represents a deeper drive for survival and for us to thrive in this new age. What, are, what exactly do we mean by that? I think there are a few critical ingredients which you, I hope you will agree with me we need when you're dealing with such a monumental challenge. Number one, we need to get our infrastructure right. For a while, maybe about 10 years ago, I had become deeply worried that we were losing our whole position for broadband connectivity. Today, with fiber to every home, two fibers in fact in every home, with the pervasive mobile broadband capability, 
think I can quite confidently state that we will make sure that on the hardware side of it, the connectivity, the computing power, the pervasiveness, we will make sure we are in the top of the league. But that's almost the easiest bit to do. Because beyond just the connectivity, the more difficult challenge is really the software side of it. And that I'm referring not to hard, not to code, but human brains. And that's why we've been focused on restructuring our education system, and in particular, not just pre-employment education, but education and opportunities for adults. And that's what we call skills future in Singapore. But beyond that, and I'm sure Eugene will have a lot more to say about it, you need smart money. Actually, the world right now in the last decade, with central banks everywhere printing money, is awash with liquidity. But smart money that comes with angel investors, venture capitalists, who know what to bet on, who are able to guide founders to form the networks, to share expertise, to share experience. It's that kind of smart money which gives a competitive advantage. That kind of ecosystem is much harder to establish, and I will tell you in all honesty, this is something which we are still working on and we're looking forward to hearing from you. But beyond this, there's also a cultural element. And you see, part of the challenge of Singapore is that we can become victims of our own success. We have been a global port, city-state, functioning as, an in, as a hub, as an interchange, as an exchange, as an emporium between East and West, India, China, Europe. We have made a very good living from management, from eking out efficiencies. But when you are facing a new age of innovation, and you actually need to generate completely new orders of thinking and of innovation. We actually need to change culture. And on this, I just wanted to end with a, a little story which... Uh, Isaac Ben Israel, I'm sure you know him. He said, you know, in Singapore, I don't know why you all are so obsessed with consensus. In Israel, we never let agreement stop an argument. <laughs> Think about that. Never let agreement stop an argument. This constant search and clash and looking for a new perspective and a novel argument we need to change those elements of the way we relate and engage one another. But even as we do so, and I think this is another point which is where the Israeli example comes about. It's still not about arguments for argument's sake, but that when you've got your back against the wall and you're facing existential challenges, your arguments better be practical and you better be able to generate practical solutions which will make a difference in a hurry. In our case, it means beyond just channeling our brightest into management roles, we need to have a culture which rewards innovation, rewards the willingness to take risks, which does not stick permanent labels of failure, because in fact you need people to fail quickly and start again, and start up again. This is another area where we need to do more work. So anyway, let me stop there because you didn't come here to listen to me. We really want to listen to Professor Kendall. But I just thought I'll give you an idea of what are some of the thoughts and the challenges confronting us. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all very much. Minister, uh, if we were to coordinate our uh, remarks, uh, we, I probably wouldn't have changed much. At least I wouldn't have changed much. So thank you for setting it up in such a great way. Uh, chairman, uh, director, members of the board, the distinguished guests, thank you. I'm very, very excited to being here. 
Uh, I'm, uh, um, for the last 22 years, I'm a professor at Hebrew University, and uh, this is my actually second lecture in four years in, at NUS. And I'm going to repeat what I said last time, is that there was a gentleman by the name Menasseh Meyer um, who connects, uh, who, who is Singaporean, um, and he, he was born in Calcutta, but um, in 1925 he gave a donation of $25,000 to Ruffles College, which is a predecessor of NUS. And a year later, Albert Einstein came to, um, to uh, Singapore together with his wife, and he, um, uh, Menasseh Meyer gave him another $25,000 to establish the Hebrew University. So uh, that one man actually connected our two venerable institutions uh, even though they were 6,000 miles apart. So in the, at that time, this was a really long distance. Um, so I'm very, very excited. Uh, I'm going to, my remarks are going to be based on two experiences. One experience is my six years as the head of the National Economic Council and my work on strategy for the Israeli government. Um, and the second one is the last four years. Actually, the previous lecture at NUS was on my first day in this job. So I, I timed it in such a way that I could put my Startup Nation Central slides. And that was the uh, November 18, 2015. So um, that, since then, the four years passed, and I'm, uh, so that experience is also part of what, what I'm going to do. So I'm going to talk about, uh, um, I'm going to talk about, thank you, I'm going to talk about um, four uh, topics. Uh, one topic about, in general, about innovation and uncertainty, and I'm actually going to talk about some of the things that the minister mentioned. Then I'm going to talk a, li a little bit about social outcomes and innovation based on Israeli experience. Uh, I'm going to cover very, very rudimentary some, something, a possible role for Israel in the Middle East uh, and how the Middle East has changed maybe even over the last decade. And uh, then maybe talk about some, some things related to Singapore also echoing what, what the minister has, has mentioned. So I want to point out to five trends which have nothing to do with Singapore or with, uh, with Israel. They are universal trends and they have everything to do with both of our countries as well as any other country in the world. So the first trend is in the post-crisis world, we are in, uh, finding ourselves in economies that have no precedent in human history. The combination of debt, low growth rates, and very, very low interest rates actually have not been seen ever. We can, as long as we can track the history of, I mean, there could be some places in, in individual countries, but as a general phenomenon. And so what that means is that all these debt cannot be inflated away and it cannot be grown after, uh, out of. And so uh, we're going to have to cut back for Singapore, luckily, doesn't have that problem, but the majority of developed world, Europe and, and the United States, uh, have this uh, big problem. Israel is somewhere in the middle. So that generated a lot of uncertainty because economists literally don't know how we're going to get out of this. It has implications for our savings, it has implications for investments, it has implications for possible outbursts of inflation, lots of uncertainty. The second part, is that aging population, it's like a slow-moving tsunami. Okay, Japan is the best example. Japan in 1950 was 50 million people, um, maybe 90% below 65, 10% above 65, maybe even less. Japan today is 120 million people, 25% above 65. Japan in, 20, in, in 80 years, again, 50,000 people. And nobody knows how many people out of that will be over 65. So that changes. It's just one example. We're all getting in that direction because we all live longer and majority of countries have much lower fertility rates than before. So we're basically changing the nature of the demograph uh, demographic pyramid. So we, we're inverting the pyramid. That affects everything we do. That affects our work life, uh, that affects our savings, that affects our when we retire, etc., um, how we plan our cities, uh, where do we get um, assistive technologies or assistance to, to care for the elderly, etc., etc. 
So that is something that introduces a lot of uncertainties because, again, we've never been in this situation. The world has never seen, you know, when Bismarck introduced social security, people lived till the age of 61. You know, that was so. They retired at 60 and basically died a year later. So today, people live, uh, if you passed 60, you're going to live roughly between 80 to 88, depending on the country you're born, but there's another 25 years on average that you're going to live. That's a diff completely different game. The third part is the center of economic gravity shifts in the world. The World Economic Gravity Center started in the Middle East, because that's where the sort of civilizations started very, very, very early on, thousands and thousands of years. Then it moved east given that China and, and India became such large countries in the rest of the region. Then it started moving west. The minister mentioned industrial revolution. The economic powers started, the, the number of people mattered less than the wealth per people, when, when the wealth started growing 250 years ago. Then with Americans' accent, it moved even into Atlantic. You can actually see some of that a little bit beyond Gibraltar, and then it started moving back again, so it's back to the Middle East. But not because Middle East is such a heavyweight, but because Middle East is right in the middle between the United States and China and, and India and the, and the Southeast Asia. So that creates, what that does, and the reason that, that the, the gravity center moves is that there is a giant number of people rapidly moving into middle class. What that does is introduces a lot of competition for resources. Uh, natural resources, food, uh, water, um, clean air, but most of all, skilled labor. And skilled labor becomes uh, movable, and everybody is trying to attract skilled labor um, back to themselves. And so that change, how do, uh, what, just to, to give you an example, when China moved three mil 300 million people to middle class, that's like creating another Western Europe. Okay, Western and Eastern Europe, sorry. So that's, that's the size of, of, of the impact, and that happened over less than 20 years. That introduced a lot of uncertainty. Climate change itself, as well as what we do to prevent climate change, introduces a lot of uncertainty because we've never been in this situation, or at least not in the recorded history. And the last part is the technological change that the minister spoke about. Um, is uh, going to introduce enormous amounts of uncertainty. And these are the technologies that are going to have, I call them solutions and disruptions. Each technology solves some problems, but it creates other disruptions which may generate problems on the social side and the political side, but also on the business side. So the disruptions are to firms, to people, to governments, to security, uh, the more we become technologically um, de dependent, the more we become vulnerable. We have to defend ourselves more because from whether from privacy individually or from terrorist attacks in the, uh, as, a, as a government, et cetera, et cetera. So whether you go for each of these technologies you go, uh, whether it's 3D printing or autonomous vehicles, you basically solve somebody's problem. So 3D printing allows people to get, let's say, a handicapped person can design their own tool and produce it very, very inexpensively next to his home. And so that solves the problem of never being able to actually fit something. But at the same time, you're going to drive a lot of people out of business and they actually make a lot of people unemployed. The same with autonomous vehicles, the same with blockchain, the same with AI, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these technologies are going to introduce a lot of disruptions. Now, the question that sometimes is asked is why is this technological revolution different from any other technological revolution? We had many of those. We had electricity introduced, we had oil introduced, we had uh, uh, steam power introduced, there's a you know, plow, et cetera, you know, whether plow was a bigger technological revolution uh, than what's going on now, I don't know, but I didn't live that time, it was a long time ago, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but there is a difference, at least uh, relative to the last couple of hundred years. And there are three, three main differences that I think that the current technological change is going to introduce much more uncertainty, much more disruption than the previous waves. The, in the past, the technology was substituting for the muscle. 
Okay, basically, whether it was my substituting for the muscle of people, for the muscle of animals, it was substituting for our muscles. And now, this, uh, the technology is substituting for our senses. We are getting, uh, we can see now with machines, we can hear with machines, we can sense, we can even smell with machines. Uh, and it substitutes our brain because we then translate these senses into, so think about what is autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is basically replacing your eyes, you see what's going on, replacing your ears, and then translating it into a bunch of actions, mechanical actions that, you know, left, right, you know, brakes, etc. Now, what is, it, what is the difference? The difference is, uh, first of all, when you replace um, a person or a muscle with machine, and you replace 10 people with one machine, in order to replace another 10 people, you need another machine. You went to your room to replace another 10 people, you need another machine. So at some point, the cost of machines will go up, the cost of uh, people will go down, and we're gonna get to a new equilibrium where the next people will not be worthwhile replacing because it's too expensive. So there, is a, uh, there are diseconomies of scale, so there is rising costs, and therefore, as a natural equilibrium. For the first time, we're having enormous economies of scale. What's economies of scale? It's basically an economic term saying that if you've written a piece of software that can replace 10 people, it can, the same piece of software can replace 10,000 people, or all the people that are working in these jobs. Okay, today, there, is a, there are companies that actually can write the code that is implemented in the uh, operational system of a company and it writes its own code to replace routine task automatically. Okay, so you can put it in any, in any system and it's just going to start identifying routine tasks and writing code to replace this task. And you don't even need intervention. That piece of machinery can replace millions of people. So you don't need additional software and additional software. There are no, no diseconomies of scale. That means that for the first time, you're going to end up potentially in a situation where you might have that you don't really need some of the people that to produce enough stuff for all of us to consume. Okay, that's something that we've never had. No model, no economic models that I know have this feature. Okay, we do need to invent new economic models because the magnitude of economies of scale um, is such that it may require uh, require these uh, new new understanding. The second thing is that the previously, over the last 200 years at least, economic, uh, sorry, technological change was contributing to a major shift from agricultural societies to manufacturing societies to service societies. We were moving rapidly from over 90% people in agriculture. Today in developed countries you have less than 2% people in agriculture. Uh, in Israel, I think it's 1.3% uh, people in agriculture. Uh, then you had a rise in manufacturing, but then you had another fall in manufacturing. So today, in developed countries, on average, you have about 80% of employed are employed in, in services. We're not going to, the current set of, of uh, technologies is hitting into the services. And it's hitting into the services. These people are not going to go into agriculture and manufacturing again. They're going to stay with services or become redundant. So that's a big difference. And the last thing is that the change, technological change, and the substitution disruptions over the last 200 years were slow. They were taking decades, if not centuries. Today, they're taking years. Just look at uh, your smartphone. I presume that majority of the people sitting in this room have a smartphone. In 2007, we didn't know what it meant, okay? And in 2007, when it came out, nobody understood what it's going to do. And yet, it's completely changed our, just, just get into a metro station and see that everybody's within their phone. Some of you are basically holding it as the most precious thing that, that you can't live without. Okay, it completely changed the way we do things. And this is just one small example. And it's happening very, very fast. So the, the, the um, speed of change and in in the, in the unpredictability of change creates a lot of uncertainty. Bottom line is, we are getting into, my claim is that we're getting into a new equilibrium 
And whether you're a single person or whether a young person, uh, whether you're a corporation, whether you are a government, young person sort of looking very forward, but it doesn't differentiate between ages, uh, all of us must adapt. If we don't adapt, we're left behind. And so the question is, how do we adapt? And what does it all mean? What is the new equilibrium? How does the equilibrium look like under rapid and unpredictable technological changes combined with, all, with other four pieces creating uh, uncertainty? Okay, and each one of them creating uncertainty because we don't know. It's complete terra incognita because we've never been in either one of those situations. And what do they do together? Okay, so that the multiplying uncertainty, they definitely don't cancel each other. And so my, the question that I'm postulating is maybe, just maybe, we no longer should think in terms of equilibria. Maybe the New equilibrium is a continuous state of change, it's a continuous state of disequilibrium in which we have to live and we better just get used to living with it. And so that requires, and it, it echoes what the minister said, in this new disequilibrium, or my, the way you might call it, you have to change your attitude. You have to be strategically flexible. You have to be strategic because you have to try to identify the changes as they're coming. But you have to be very, very able to make mistakes and acknowledge that the system is embedded to make mistakes and quickly correct them. So it requires culture, but it also requires a set of skills to constantly be updating. So the generation, there are some uh, very young pe people uh, sitting here. They are, um, your generation is going to be very, very different from my generation in terms of how your work life and career would look like because you're going to have to live continuously with change. I've been sort of living with, with change over the later part of my career and so I, you can still uh, work out sort of based on your, on your uh, reputation, etc. But going forward, it's going to be much tougher. So that's my first point. The second point, and it has a lot of the uncertainty, in general has a lot of um, uh, uh, challenges, and that's uh, what brings me to social outcomes. And here I would like to talk about what we know about Israel. And the reason Israel is, is uh, interesting in that space is because this picture uh, applies to it probably more than to any country in the world. Uh, well, at least it, it's, it's, it's up there. So when I talked about uh, Israeli economy, I always say that there is no such thing as Israeli economy. Israel has two economies, and they are almost completely disconnected. There's one economy that's on the bottom, that is more traditional economy, that is heavily regulated, that is much less productive, that is much more reliant on the government, much more watched over by the government, much more domestic attitude by the participants. It has, and then there is this Zeppelin economy, which has, uh, which is innovation economy, which has an attitude, it's almost entirely focused outward, because Israel is a small country, so all your markets are outside. It should be familiar to Singaporeans. Um, all, most of its capital, that's the difference between Singapore and Israel, that most of its capital also comes from outside. Uh, all, of its, uh, um, all of its competitors are outside of the country, although some of them are Israeli, but they all feel as if they were uh, international competitors. The attitudes of the people uh, is very much cosmopolitan, and uh, they are very, very productive. Uh, and um, the scary thing about this is they highly movable. Remember what I said about the competition for skilled labor? This is the most skilled labor. So any country would love uh, to get another country's Zeppelin economy. I mean, so everybody's tugging at them. We're all tugging at the economies. Uh, Israel is probably one of the few countries that not tugging at it because the, the reason that for Israel it's the most um, representative picture because that Zeppelin actually represents 15% of our economy. So we're basically running out of, of, of uh, space for that, and I'll, I'll expand on that. The challenge that it generates is that it's almost um, 
inherently creates stratification of society. These are the people in the Zeppelin, are the people who are empowered by, by technology. And the people on the ground, these are people who are disrupted by technology. Remember I talked about solutions. So these people that are creating solutions in the Zeppelin economy for some of the people on the bottom economy, they're actually disrupting. So you cannot be too popular when you create mass unemployment with one piece of software, okay, or mass uh, layoffs. So there is inherent tension between these two economies. And the people in these two economies are very, very different. They're very differently trained. they financed very differently. They have even different regulations because each country tries to attract these Zeppelins, so they try to be more um, conducive for the people and the companies in the Zeppelin to come to them. So that creates uh, a challenge. And so if you're a country and you want this Zeppelin, you have to figure out three questions. How do you create an environment in which your economy, uh, traditional economy, can grow? What are the uh, environment in which your Zeppelin economy can grow and stay above your country? And how do you reconcile these two economies to live together in one society? These are very, very tough questions that do not yet have uh, answers um, that, that, we, uh, that, that, that are adequate. So if we look at Israeli economy, and this explains why for Israel that picture was so, um, so relevant, is that in terms of density of the, of the innovation ecosystem in Israel, uh, it's probably the most dense ecosystem in the world as, as a country. Uh, we are uh, either number one or number two in terms of R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Uh, we have the highest percent, a number of startups per capita. We, have, we are very highly ranked uh, in uh, innovation, various innovation rankings. But the numbers on the bottom, it just shows you that on per capita level, uh, per capita counting, we get over twice the amount of VC capital relative to US, which is much higher, and the US is much higher than anybody else. So this is, this is something that is, uh, uh, creates that, that large uh, Zeppelin economy that I was talking about. The dark side of that is that this economy requires a lot of very skilled people. And even, even uh, um, since Israel produces a lot of uh, skilled people, given that the economy is so tilted in that direction, we have a, a chronic shortage. And that chronic shortage manifests itself in these numbers. So if you take the Zeppelin economy, and you take the wages of the Zeppelin economy, and you divide them by the wages of the non-Zeppelin economy, the economy at the bottom, the average in OECD is one and a half. So the salaries in the bottom are 50% higher than at the, uh, sorry, uh, at the, in the Zeppelin are 50% higher than at the bottom. In Israel, they're 150% higher, okay? and, the and the distance is growing. And this is the cost of the success of the innovation ecosystem. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have done that. I'm not saying that, we, that I don't recommend others to do that because it's, it actually uh, increased the, the wealth and, and the, uh, uh, the well-being of a lot of people, but if we were caught, in some sense, unprepared in terms of making enough people to actually not let this happen. Okay, the reason that it happens is that the demand far outstripped the supply because the supply sort of was following one path, and the demand was following its own its own path that was driven by driven by the markets. So these are these are numbers that are not comfortable, and these numbers, by the way, do not include the sale of the companies, which in Israel is the normal way to exit, is to actually sell a lot of companies, which is another challenge that we have to deal with. But um, so the people in the Zeppelin are getting all these wealth. And the minister was talking about the, the, you know, the top 20 or 100 people that are becoming ex incredibly rich. But I'm talking about the additional layer of the same argument of thousands of people that are getting millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars every year 
spread among them through options and through various uh, sales of stock. So this is not accounted here. So there's a lot of wealth that is being um, generated. So if you take lifetime incomes and divide them, the, the, the ratio is significantly high. So that is, a, that is a challenge, and this challenge, the question is how do you address it? And so that translates into actually a series of social challenges. So similar to what the minister said, growing inequality is a feature. It's not a bug. It's unpleasant, but it's a feature of these technological innovation. It's always been there, and it always will be, because when the only difference now is that because of these economies of scale, and economies of scale not only in costs, but also in data accumulation, you have enormous accumulation of power and wealth by very few corporates. Okay, and there is not much we can do about it unless there is a government, some kind of government regulation. The problem that the government, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna move to that. The second thing I mentioned that is that there is a first time in the history we may have too many people for the jobs that are actually being required. Okay, so the question is, do we all take a cut of 50%, let's say we have 50% redundant people, let's say just, uh, just for the sake of the argument. If we have 50% redundant people, how do you deal with that? Well, we actually, uh, it's a huge problem. In my opinion, if this is true, if this is a possibility, this is going to be the main challenge of any country, because they, because it's, it cannot be sustainable politically. It creates such a social stress that it forces huge transfer of resources from those that are working to those that are not working. Now, the problem is that the traditional redistribution tools do not work anymore, because remember that the majority of wealth is generated in Zeppelin, and Zeppelin is highly movable. This is no longer machinery or natural resources that are stuck in the ground, and you cannot move them from country to country. These are highly movable people, highly movable IP, and highly movable capital. Okay, so the country is facing an interesting dilemma. Well, interesting in the old Chinese version of that word. Um, you say you have to choose, are you going to be more equitable and then basically start raising taxes on the Zeppelin economy and risking it being pulled out of, out, out of your country? Or you're saying, look, I can live with high inequality as long as it lifts all boats. Okay, if we're raising standards of living of everybody, we can live with this economy, but it may not lo no longer be possible to raise the standard of living of everybody because you need relatively few people in that Zeppelin economy. And people may not accept the outcome that may be beneficial for them because there is no understanding that it's not a bug, it's a feature. At least in Israel, there is no understanding of that. And so every, the inequality is the most used word in the newspaper every day. And there is uh, blaming uh, government policies, etc. But the main driver is actually this. Okay, People can no longer afford, if you're not in the financial industry or in the tech industry, you can no longer afford to live in Tel Aviv. Basically, they drove prices. I, but when, when I sometimes say that they want the quality of life, which drives everybody else's cost of living up, okay? That because they fixed fixed resources, and so the problem is that it goes back to governments. But the governments are not very well equipped. Uh, I take uh, I, I think that uh, among all governments in the world, I think Singaporean government is the most equipped to deal with this because it is very long term looking and constantly. Uh, worried about long-term implications of these things. I mean, there are very, very few governments that I know that are actually uh, thinking that way. But still, the governments, as a, as a rule, are not very well equipped to, ch to deal with innovation and, and change. Even on the regulatory, one of the biggest issues, for example, 
is how to deal with the uh, regulation of algorithms. And uh, that is something that, that governments are not, are not good at. And the problem is because of all these competition for these Zeppelin, you cannot solve it as an individual optimization. You have to solve it as a joint optimization. There's got to be some kind of taxation harmonization policy. And we don't even see a taxation and harmonization policy within the European Union. It's vehemently opposed. So we, at some point, we're going to have to sit down. The governments of the world are going to have to sit down and, and figure out how to, how to collaborate on that. Because without that, I'm fairly pessimistic about the, the outcomes. So now Israel and the Middle East. I'm not going to say anything that you don't know, and I'm a bit humbled uh, by this. Uh, but, you know, since it's a Middle East center, I said, I said, you know, I have to say something about the Middle East. There are two things uh, about this. Uh, one is that the traditional representation of the situation in the Middle East was that, A, Israel against Arabs. This was sort of the dichotomy. And that majority of problems in the Middle East was due to Israeli aggression or Israeli presence or Israeli whatever. That was fairly long ago. Um, it was probably not true then, but it did, it's today it's no longer even said by majority of sort of thinking people. Today, the Middle East is partitioned between uh, countries that want stability, want economic progress, want um, collaboration and countries that either want uh, disequilibrium and, and uh, uh, lack of progress uh, or are forced into it. So if you look at, you, it's pretty easy to, to, uh, to identify which ones are which, but if you think about sort of Morocco and Algeria and Tunis Tunisia and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel and uh, Turkey to some extent, uh, parts of Iraq, all the Gulf states, um, these are the countries that are trying to create stability because stability is, is good for the, for the people of these countries, for the, for the rulers of these countries. And um, so the interest between Israel and Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Gulf states and Morocco and Algeria are much closer than the interest between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran, for example, or Egypt and Lib Libya. The second part is that it's understood by everybody that Israel uh, is no longer or perhaps never been the sole source of, of uh, uh, problems in the Middle East. Uh, whether you take Libya's problems or Yemen's problems, Iran-Iraq war, uh, Turkey, Syria, Syria itself, etc., uh, etc., et none of that has anything to do with Israel. And if Israel were to disappear from that region, they would still remain. Now, so what's uh, so? Given we've said that, um, there are a couple of points that I wanted to make. None of them are particularly um, um, earth-shattering. So the first of all is that within that belt of countries that want collaboration, want stability, etc., there is already quite a lot of collaboration with Israel. Uh, the only difference is that it's under the radar since uh, this, the, the people of these countries were educated to see Israel with basically horns on its head, um, there's still not, you don't advertise uh, collaboration with Israel, but it does, uh, it does uh, create, you know, a friend of mine uh, who is Israeli now lives in one of the Gulf states. He chose to live there because it's a, it's a nice environment for, to raise his kids. I mean, it, it's just uh, he, of course, lives under foreign passport, but still, this is something. And he says that everybody that he knows knows that he's Israeli, and everybody wants to, 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 to bring technology from Israel. And it, that, that doesn't bother anybody. So it's, it's, just, it's just a small example, but it's, but it's indicative. So there is a lot of collaboration, but it's just scratching the surface. A lot of value can be created. The second thing is that there are 21% of Israeli citizens are Arabs. And so this is a natural bridge to, uh, to the rest of the Arab world due to the knowledge of culture, to the knowledge of language. And so there is already quite a significant uh, operations by technology setting up all kinds of platforms in Arab world that are coming out of Israel. 
through with Israeli Arabs, sometimes they're entrepreneurs, sometimes they are the operators. So there is some progress. Again, there could be those two things can be combined, and there is a huge win-win for the Arab population of Israel as well for transition of technology into this way, into the this region. However, in the meantime, for the reasons that I've outlined, you need um, intermediaries, and I think Singapore is a perfect example, not only of uh, expanding to Southeast Asia, being a hub to Southeast Asia, but also being the hub for Israeli, specifically Israeli technology, and together with Singaporean technology, into the Middle East. So that is something that I would, uh, would definitely encourage to think about. And finally, the Singapore and Israel. Well, there is a long, long-standing friendship between the two countries. It's, uh, it's really heartwarming to, to, to come here and then host uh, our Singaporean friends in, in Israel. And there is, uh, you know, we, there is a, almost a cliche that each country has to, uh, you know, going back to ministers' points of how to find the new drive for innovation or where to locate uh, I, was, I was talking to Minister Chan yesterday, and he was asking, how do you choose where to put the resources, what, what to promote? Uh, and I think there is no single recipe. And so Israeli experience is only to a certain extent relevant to Singapore, and the Singaporean experience only to a certain extent relevant to Israel, but we definitely can learn from each other. The, in my opinion, and I'm very, you know, I'm qualified... Uh, um, sort of view because I cannot see myself as an expert on, on, on Singapore, but from many, many conversations and discussions with various people, it seems that the people, the culture, the systems, and the, most of all, the strategic long-term view, which is unique to, to this government as well to the uh, society, uh, as well as, of course, access and understanding of Southeast Asia put a very, very uh, specific sweet spot of scaling up innovation here that comes from all over the world and being an especially innovation that has long gestation periods. Because today, more and more investors are shrinking their, uh, uh, the, the, their appetite for longer investments is shrinking. And it's, it's uniformly across all the investors that I see. Everybody wants to have immediate satisfaction because somebody's breathing down their neck. Singaporean investors, I can see capabilities to invest very long term and invest in private capital. For example, Norwegians are not investing in private capital. They're only investing in publicly traded. So you basically you know, give up on majority of innovation. So that is, in my opinion, a very, very interesting combination of things that can create a permanent or long-lasting advantage for Singapore economy. Um, one uh, one uh, advice is that don't repeat Israeli mistake. You know, look forward to the human capital needs and be prepared long ahead uh, of time rather than sort of in ex post. So that is something that I wish we would have thought about long time ago. We are trying to correct that, but it's much harder to do it uh, once you're already in the shortage. And of course, versatility and readiness for change that you've mentioned is, are, are, are crucial. And the last point, I think, is uh, more general, uh, where Singapore and, and Israel are both small countries. And small, technologically advanced countries have a lot in common. They are nimble, they are easier to pivot, they are on average more entrepreneurial, and uh, the, these are good things, but in the world of economies of scale, this is a disadvantage because you can be very, very dense ecosystem, but you multiply that by size, you're still a small ecosystem. And so, especially in the world which, in which technology drives, uh, is driven by scale and drives scale, we lose because we're small. So it's difficult to compete with giants. In the past, it was giants that you mentioned, uh, this was countries. Now, in addition to countries, there is also corporates that are grouped be precisely because of the same, the same economies of scale. They grew and they're now competing at the level of countries. Google is investing in various technologies more than the vast majority of countries because they can, because that's their business. 
And so how do you cope with that? Well, there are two levels of coping. One level within the country, one level across countries. So this is something that I'm constantly advocating within my country, and I would give it as advice because there are similarities. So the first thing is you must choose your focus. You cannot compete on all scale. You're just not big enough. Not you, I mean, as a small country. So you have to pull resources, and this, is, uh, this means that you have to, um, have to be ruthless in terms of sort of not deciding not to go in certain areas. Now, however, you never know which areas you need to go because this is all new. So there's got to be a piece of that that says, I'm going to go to all areas on small scale and see what works, and then kill certain ones. So there's got to be a room for experimentation. Along the pooling, got to be a lot of room for experimentation because that's, otherwise you don't know what to pull into. Then you repeat sort of meaty mistakes from the, from the 80s that, you know, we're just going to go there and no matter what, what, what's going to happen, we're just going to continue walking. The second thing, so that's within the country. But there is additional gain which is more difficult, but I think more important. And here I would like to use it's Isaac Ben Israel is now heading the uh, committee, which I'm a member of, on AI in Israel. How does Israel cope with this thing? And by the way, AI has civic uh, applications, and you have to deal with that, you know, health and uh, transportation and uh, finance and all other things, but it also has military implications. So there is the security issues. And so uh, one of the things that we are thinking about is how can we create pooling of resources with other single uh, like-minded countries. So Singapore is the first country that comes to mind about, about this because, but there are other countries, think about Finland, think about Estonia, New Zealand, and, and a few others. So if we pull resources on AI, whether it's um, computing power, whether it's data, whether it's uh, knowledge, whether it's people, if we create combinations and we pull them together, we can compete. If we don't, we're going to be in very we're going to be in the orbit of the two, three, four, ten giants, whether they're companies or governments. And so um, I think that Singapore and Israel, given the sort of the relations, the, the very you know uh, active and 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 long-standing relations between the two countries and the complementarity between the two countries in various uh, capacities and, and capabilities, I think that it's an only natural that such alliances that would be broader could be started by, by our two countries, and they need to be led initially by governments. So there is a one example, uh, the Forum of Small Advanced Economies that we're both members of, but that forum is more much more about discussion. I think there's got to be much more actionable items on that, sort of pulling, pulling resources in, in a way that creates the sum that's bigger than the, 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 the total that are bigger than the sum of parts. I hope that I didn't bore you too much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kandel. Let me now invite our acting director, Ms. Michelle Thio, to the stage for the question and answer session. Okay, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, um, I I have to say that you know after I left the foreign ministry, I went to IBM, and as a big, it's a global enterprise, and even for the tech industry, there's a lot of disruption and disequilibrium, and uh, so it was interesting to hear what you had to say about what happens, uh, what is going on in Israel, and some of the issues that we would face here in Singapore. So let me uh, now open up the floor. For questions. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll take
two or three questions. Can you identify yourself, ask your question, and then uh, Professor Kandel will answer them as a sort of a cluster. Okay, so does anybody have a question? If you want to, just the microphone is here. Identify yourself first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to, the mic is at the back, Ambassador. So I'll introduce you to uh, the ambassador. This is the Israeli ambassador, and we're meeting for the first time, so thank you. Your question, sir. Is it on? Thank you, sir. It's okay. Um, in, in, in the past, from, from a government point of view, um, we used to feel a little bit of uh, uneasiness seeing um, um, Israeli uh, tech companies growing only to a certain uh, size and then happily uh, making an exit, happily bought by um, usually American uh, big corporation. Um, later on, we, we changed a little bit our view because we thought uh, actually it's not that bad because from every company which got sold, there are going to be many new uh, tech companies. So actually, it's not it's not that uh, not that bad. You talk about the uh, uh, Zeppelin economy, and you know companies can move. Um, we saw that uh, many companies that have been uh, bought actually left some of their R and D uh, capabilities in Israel, but. I suspect that after five, ten years, actually, the center of gravity of many companies actually moved out of Israel. Is it something of a concern, do you think? Or, and if so, if there is anything that the government can do in a, in a, wise, and a wise manner? Any other question? Yes. Hello, my name is Stilak Doshi. I'm from the Middle East Institute. Uh, one of the more interesting questions about innovation and, and the role of government in particular um, is the very uh, well-known argument that governments hardly ever pick winners. And you alluded to that with the example of METI in Japan. Um, uh, I, in our own country, uh, uh, Go King Sui, the economic architect of Singapore, uh, in one of his earlier articles himself said that uh, very seldom can a committee of government officials uh, pick winners and entrepreneurs. So from your point of view, uh, you know, with your experience in Israel, how does the government face those issues with respect to promoting innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you. Those are actually two interesting questions. One more? Yes, Andres. Professor, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm Andres Go from Allianz. And I wanted to ask you, um, perhaps it's a little left field, um, maybe not exactly in your area of focus, but I wanted to find out your views on the uh, US-China trade war, um, the sense of technological uh, nationalism and warfare between governments, how you think it will come out, and how should other governments uh, respond? Thank you. Uh, OK. Um, the easiest one is the last one. I have no idea. <laughs> So I think the minister maybe is a better person to ask this question, but I don't think he can answer it. I mean, so uh, maybe Bill Harry will be, will be a much better person to, to answer that. Look, I mean, it's bad for, for, for uh, but it's, it's almost um, inevitable because there is a sense of um, race between exactly because of these economies of scale. And uh, this race is... Um, uh, started from uneven positions, and both countries feel that their rights uh, are being restricted 
uh, United States is restricted because there's a lot of industrial espionage and other things that are happening, and so they say, why are you doing this? And the right and the Chinese feel that they have the same right to the same standard of living and the power as the United States. And so there's a clash of those two drives. Each country feels completely within its rights to, to do what it does, and even obligation to its citizens. So I, I hope that um, there will be some common sense and they somehow can sort of come down and, and create some kind of path for, for doing, you know, achieving both ends without really pissing each other off and, and, and uh, or worse. Uh, how they're going to do it, you know, which uh, would be would be very rich man if I could gamble on these things and know what's going to happen even with 52% probability. So I'm going to move to the easier questions of what should government do for the next 20 years. So it's uh, much easier to predict. Um, to Sagi's point, um, actually this illustrates a few points that I made and I, I'm going to give you a little story so that it, it illustrates it. Because it illustrates the fragility of a small country. So Israel uh, started sort of the, this uh, innovation revolution in Israel and real scaling up started in the early 90s. And really accelerated during the 90s when uh, over a million people came from the former Soviet Union with tens of thousands of engineers and, and uh, computer science, et cetera. So there was a flood of people that were fueling this economy. The standard operating procedure uh, of these companies um, was to raise VC funding, early funding, then maybe Series A, and when they reached 30, 40 million dollar valuation, they would go and list on NASDAQ. The reason for that was institutional, because Israeli government um, launched a very successful program called Yuzma in 93, and that program created the VC industry, but early stage VC industry. There was no late stage investment vehicles in Israel for, at all. And so the companies didn't have any late stage companies, so they went public. So by the end of 1999, there were more Israeli companies on NASDAQ than any other countries outside of the United States, and more than entire Europe. Okay, Israel is a small country, really small. So this was, an, uh, this was a really driven by these features. 2001 crash, uh, all kinds of corporate scandals, nothing to do with Israel. It's internal American issues. Sarbanes-Oxley is passed. And Sarbanes-Oxley basically thought that they were imposing fifty to $100,000 uh, worth of regulatory costs on a company they were imposing a million dollars, actually imposing a million dollars on a small company and about eight million dollars a year on a large company. Now that means that if you're a small 30 million dollar company, if you go public, you basically give away a third of your company just into regulatory course. So that basically makes it completely unreasonable to go public. Nobody would take you public. And so this venue stopped. This could have been unrelated to anything that Israel has done could have been the end of Israeli uh, success story because all of these companies should have gone to Silicon Valley to start raising late stage capital because there's nothing, nothing in Israel. So the next uh, American regulation, fortunately they had another regulation that allowed American companies to keep their earnings, foreign earnings outside of the United States and not pay any, any corporate tax on them. So these companies were flush with cash including IBM and uh, Microsoft and others. And they didn't really have much to do with it. They just kept it outside of the United States because they didn't want to repatriate and pay 39% pay tax. In retrospect, they ended up paying 23% tax, so it was a smart decision. And so suddenly they see a country with hundreds of companies, nothing to do with them, and they started buying them. So the number of R&D centers that were established in Israel between 2004 and today is uh, about almost 400. So any other country would have loved to have R&D centers, uh, very, very highly paid jobs. Well, unfortunately, it's actually no more blessing. It's no longer a blessing. 
because we're facing a shortage of human capital. And so all these foreign companies coming in and taking the jobs that could have gone to start new companies and actually siphoning them to themselves. So everything is good by measure, okay? If you do it too much, you get a hangover. So we're in the hangover stage, or the beginning of the hangover stage. So the, it's actually a, a, a problem, and um, uh, uh, it, of, of two, two sides. First of all, the majority of value that you create is actually after you, you started when you scale up. And so Singapore is very good in scaling companies. We, until recently, were not very good in scaling companies, especially in the last 20 years because of these issues. Now we do have a late stage capital industry. Now we do have um, a lot of uh, supporting infrastructure. We have management capabilities. We have marketing capabilities. So we now see companies that if they sold, some of them are sold for billions and billions of dollars uh, rather than 40, 50, 100 million dollars. So that is, that is something. But the government should, in my opinion, and we are actively talking to them, think about how to create whole companies rather than R&D centers in Israel. Because otherwise, we're going to become basically an R&D lab for the world. And this Zeppelin story is going to hit us in the face, because then there's going to be no connection whatsoever and no political support for people working for Google, making a lot of money and driving everybody else out of the main cities. It's just not, not going not gonna to sustain, be sustainable. So the, um, the second point um, about uh, the government picking winners, um, that is true, uh, but it depends how uh, governments do it, because the same can be said about VCs. VCs also don't know how to pick win winners. They just experiment a lot. And then some of them are actually winners. And so, in my opinion, that's the, what governments should be doing. The government should not be saying, well, we're just going to get into this and go no matter what, before experimenting with it. And so, experimentation is an incredibly important part. And the governments are also much worse than VCs killing things that don't work, because it creates their own momentum you know, the subsidies, they, I always give this example, the United States still have subsidies for beehive keepers that were instituted in 1932. You can't cancel them. There's no, because at that time, they, there were shortage of, of uh, beehives, or bees. So they introduced subsidies for the next almost 100 years. That's, that's the biggest problem of the government. Yes. My name is Shikata, a company fellow of Mitsena Company Limited. Let me ask you a startups. I lived in Singapore in 1990s and very much impressed with Singapore's strategic development. I have the impression the key word is meritocracy. But in case of uh, in this uh, IT world, to find who are talented and how to educate, how to retain them, I, I think this is quite difficult because it is difficult to judge if they are talented or not from traditional educational methods. And their appearance can be quite different. Some of them even look like hippies. So how Israel? Intentional. <laughs> <laughs> how Israel is tolerant enough to hire such talented people, although they look like quite different, how Israel is tolerant enough to let them fail many times, but eventually succeed in the new innovation. Thank you. Um, thank you for your, for your question. It's, it's actually a very, very um, big issue for, for my, for my uh, firm. I mean, we are a nonprofit that does all kinds of things to promote Israeli innovation and make sure that it thrives for the next couple of decades. So this issue is at the center of what, what, one of the main things that we do because Israel did not do a good job to prepare enough. It prepared a lot, but it didn't prepare enough to, to, to uh, 
Um, the Israeli culture and the way we raise, uh, there's a new book called Chutzpah by my former associate. Uh, she claims that the way we raise children, which is a completely unruly way to, to raise children, um, you would not want to go into a typical Israeli school on a recess or even during class. I mean, that's not a pleasant sight. It's just complete chaos. Um, so there is, a, there is some be, something to be said. Children are given a lot of freedoms and a lot of um, ways to challenge authority. And so, so the, it's it's very, very cultural thing. But uh, only some of the children grow this way. So these uh, Jewish non-Orthodox, non-ultra-Orthodox children grow up this way. Uh, there are other populations in Israel uh, that don't grow up this way, and you have very, very d distinct uh, cultures, subcultures in those, in those populations. So we actually do a fairly good job on one population. Actually, an excellent job. Uh, this population are men from about four metropolitan areas and some other smaller places where they have good education, they come from middle class or upper middle class families. In those, uh, I presume that almost a third of all men work in the tech industry, which is incredible, incredible numbers. When you go to women, uh, the comparable numbers are less than 10%, and in general, uh, they are, uh, if you take men and women in general, not just out of those specific populations, the difference is 14% versus 4%. So there is a huge underrepresentation. It's not an Israeli phenomenon. But uh, given that Israel faces such a shortage, we can't afford that. When you go to ultra-Orthodox and Arabs, you see less than 2% uh, chances of going into high tech. So there is a huge differences. So we do a good job on one population, we basically give up on them. So my organization, I'll give you an example. My organization decided to do an experiment. We're actually gonna run this experiment six times, a proper experimentation. Because we didn't know what's gonna work. But we do know that people uh, that are graduating from computer sciences, if you Arab or if you ultra-Orthodox woman, because ultra-Orthodox men rarely go to, to do uh, academic studies, uh, they finish their studies and then they find it very hard to find a job or they go to QA, quality assurance, which are jobs that A, pay very little and B, going to be automated within a decade. So they're going to be stuck. And we asked, it couldn't be that the distribution of talent is so different. So we decided, let's take one class of Arab men uh, and women, actually, uh, that have computer degrees and take uh, another class of Haredi women or, or ultra-Orthodox women. You can't mix them because women have to be within their own society. It's because of religious reason. And let's run them through a four months um, boot camp, three and a half months boot camp, where we teach them computing much harder, but we actually teach them much more softer skills. How to, ch we're changing their culture. We're, changing, we're giving them self-confidence. We're giving them the ability to lose face. Literally, in Arab society, you don't send a resume unless you're very highly convinced that you might be actually hired. No, Jewish Israeli has no problem sending 100 resumes and getting rejected 95 times. An Arab Israeli, by culture, has a problem with that. Okay, or not going to interview. You say, you know, I'm... I'm there is, a, there is a cultural thing. So three and a half months later, we have ris raised their salary. 80% of these people are employed. Their average salary is instead of $2,000 a month, $5,000 a month. Okay, three and a half months of training. Did we know that it will succeed? We didn't. Did all of them succeed in those? Yeah. No. But we now have people because we now have a company, which many of you would know, Mobileye, that never interviewed an Arab for an algorithmic position, position in the algorithm division, which is like really, really high end. Graduates of top universities go there and even for them it's hard. Today there are two Arabs and one ultra-Orthodox woman 
our graduates working there, they came out of colleges because they followed them and they changed their perception for these people. So this is not only how you train them, this is also what kind of skills you provide and what kind of perception you change because we taught the companies how to interview them and how to read their body language. And we taught them how to change their body language. So you have to, in, in, even though we always thought that this is a purely meritocratic industry, it doesn't discriminate against this or that, they don't care. Do you have a degree, you don't have a degree, as long as you're good at what you do, you're in. Turns out that's not true. As any other uh, sector, they have their own preconceptions. And you can change those things. And like you said, I, I, I completely agree with you, that the standard ways of testing and testing and testing are not always the best way to do it. It might be that experimenting with people is a much better way to do it and letting them just uh, run with it uh, is, 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 is actually something that we are hoping to, to adopt. Anthony. Thank you very much. We have bonus presentation by the minister and you. My first part of the question is the social implication of innovation. And in the first round, as he said, in the industrial part, in around the early 1900s, there was the philanthropy of Carnegie, which is very strongly education, which create the research, education, higher education. You know? Currently in the new tech, we have the Bill Gates, Buffett. They are very focused on healthcare, which basically makes life longer and makes it more difficult in your presentation. But my second part is more to do with scale and government. So you talk about Israel and Singapore, which is interesting. But we should bring China in because China very much and people talk about the Singapore model in China, based on whatever Ting Xiaoping came in 1978, and our Deputy Prime Minister retired, Go Keng Sui, spent a great deal of time in China. So the model is by and large Singapore model. And if you are talking about scale, that is hugely large scale. So if you talk about Israel and Singapore, I'd like to hear from you Israel and China on the same scope? And it's a tough one. I actually, um, I, was, um, I was accompanying the Prime Minister in 2013 to his visit to, to China after a long period of some tensions between Israel and China for some unrelated reasons. So we, we came there and we were sitting with uh, Premier Li Keqiang and um, he said, uh, China needs Israel. China needs Israel innovation. We want to set up a, which was not agreed upon prior through diplomatic channels, so it took us by surprise. So he said, we, I want to set up an, a, a task force, and I want to set it now, and I'm going to put NDRC, and I'm going to put the Minister of Trade. Whom are you going to put? And the Prime Minister looked around, he was, was completely surprised. He looked around, saw me, and said, I'm going to put him. And said, so I got stuck with a diplomat. No, no, this was no. It just took about 35 to 40% of my time right, right uh, for the next two years. So, so I actually dealt with, uh, with, uh, with these issues. And there is a, um, we passed government resolutions about strategic relations with China, et cetera. We set up all kinds of interesting relationship. And there is a, but I, I want, and there is a lot of potential to collaborate with China. Uh, for small countries, as there are a lot of potential to collaborate with the United States. However, I want to qualify uh, between what I said about small countries pooling their resources and bringing each other into a sort of a union. It's not against anybody. It's for creating a critical mass that allows you to, to be a contender for, com for competition, not for the first place, but to stay in the race. Bringing into such a relationship one of the two giant countries is basically taking sides. 
And this is immediately makes you uh, no longer a standalone contender, but in an orbit of that country. So um, Israel has a very, very strong, long-lasting relationship with the United States. There are certain things that we do only with them. Israel has developed over the last 20, whatever, five years, 20, since 92, 27 years, and especially in the last six years since 2013, very strong relations with China. Uh, we do not want to take sides. We do not want to be in the position where we have to take sides. But when I, when I think about Israel, Singapore, Singapore, Israel, New Zealand, Finland, etc., it's not about taking sides with China or with, with the United States. Because given what, what um, uh, the previous question that was, uh, was asked about where this whole war is going to happen, the last thing we want to be is on, on force to, to, to take sides. Uh, or being interpreted as we've taken sides. And so I think that this uh, discussion that I suggested and the discussion that you suggested, two very useful discussions, they're just not the same discussion. They sh in my opinion, they should be separated very, very, very clearly. One of them is about joint infrastructure. Another one is about collaboration with the rest of the world, which for you is basically everybody and for us, most of the world. So that, that, that would be my, my answer to in that. Um. Yes, you have a question. Uh, dear Minister, I'm a uh, Singaporean, but I've lived in uh, China and India. And uh, we are a fund manager looking at cryptocurrencies investment. Uh, what's your view of cryptocurrency and how is it going to change the various uh, uh, ways in which governments will be looking at this new technological innovation? Uh, the other question is, what is your bet? Uh, because uh, we have the Russian now coming out with their own, we have Facebook coming out with their own, what, is, what would be your bet for cryptocurrency? Um, uh, last time I was asked this question was yesterday, so I'm going to give you the same answer as I remember. Um, I don't, uh, I don't ne never bet on, I usually never bet, but, but never bet on things that I don't understand. So, um, if I think about cryptocurrency, I would like to separate them into two pieces. One piece is the underlying technology, which is blockchain and the distributed ledger, which is an enormous breakthrough for very, very wide uh, set of uses, and the cryptocurrency itself. If you look at blockchain and cryptocurrencies, um, I asked the, the governor of the, the Bank of Israel to set up a committee about five years ago to study how Israel should look at this. And at that time, there was no understanding in the government of this difference between the blockchain and the cryptocurrency. And so they were afraid of both of them. Today, there is a very, very clear separation in Israel and everywhere else in the world that there is a two very, very different things. One of them is infrastructural technology, which you try to adopt as much as possible in variety of fields because it makes your life easier and simpler, etc. But it also disrupts the hell out of all bunch of industries. And then the cryptocurrency. The cryptocurrency is still feared. Okay, and it's feared, I don't know whether these reasons are completely justified or they are just uh, like any central banker. You have to be very, very conservative. And today it's not popular to be a, a central banker because of this conservatism. But uh, Central bankers are protecting us from financial crisis. And financial crisis is different from economic crisis in the sense that it has very, very long-lasting effects, and it actually kills the very fabric of society. And we see all these anti-politics and politics of no, and the, um, you know, these very, very anti-feelings, the Brexits, etc. In, in many people's opinion, these are the results of the 2008-2009 of the financial crisis because people, the, people lose faith in the very system. If they don't know that their money is safe, 
uh, they just lose, you know, it's, a, it's no longer, I don't, I, know, I don't want to deal with all the financial system. If you don't deal with financial system, you basically kill your economy. So the, the, the central bankers are afraid of, of this, and therefore they are willing to go into great length to protect ourselves or their uh, economies from that. And so they act in, in the same manner vis-a-vis -vis cryptocurrencies, and you can see what happened with Libra, where most of the backers actually backed out, uh, out of this. Uh, we, it remains to be seen whether they're going to launch it or not. I don't know whether whether these uh, or any of these currencies will um, become mainstream uh, anytime soon because of this fear. So there is, but at the same time, I'm sure that some countries will start experimentation. Smaller countries that have more gain from that than to lose from the risk to their country of the of the crisis. And so I think it will come from countries like Estonia or. So. At the same time, these countries cannot antagonize bigger countries because, uh, you know, if President Trump sneezes, Estonia basically closes its doors if it, if it antagonizes this. So it's not, it, it, they have to do it very, very carefully. At the same time, in my opinion, long term, 15, 20 years from now, we're going to have many different ways of payment based on blockchain. It's just an exchange will be much simpler and much less costly than this usual banking system. The question is whether the banks are going to adopt these technologies and actually create their own currencies. After all, banknotes are notes of banks. I mean, the central currencies actually came out of banks. They may go back to the banks. So uh, it may be that payment systems will evolve in some kind of forms of so-called cryptocurrencies will be there whether they're going to be the only medium of exchange, whether they're going to be centralized medium of exchange, I don't know. But first of all, we have to overcome the fear of central bankers for, for collapse and loss of, of authority and loss of control. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm Eldon and I'm a student from Ishun Innova Junior College. And my question to you is that early on you mentioned that in Israel, technological uh, innovation actually causes um, inequality. Do you think that instead of exacerbating um, the issue of inequality, can technology innovation actually solve inequality? Well, we, we're still looking for, for ways to do that. I think one of the areas which I'm putting my hopes on is actually edutech, because the solution, at least in a small country, in a big country, a big country cannot escape average effects. Small country can, for the very simple reason that if it's smart and if it's strategic, it can actually benefit more from all this uncertainty and all this upheaval by serving other much larger markets relative to the hit that it's going to take on its own population. So there is there's enough. Uh, large country cannot do that. Okay, China and United States are going to be hit on with the average hit of the world economy. Um, the, uh, it, uh, the but the way for smaller countries to actually figure out the way that I'm advocating to Israeli government is that we have to uh, try to figure out how to take uh, all these other populations that I mentioned that today do not get access to high tech or to being empowered by computers and bring as many of those and the relative to this gentleman's uh, uh, point about how you train and identify the talent. Uh, there is much, much more talent that can be uh, gainfully used in that industry than the industry currently has access to. And the industry has to become more flexible and less preconceptional. Uh, but also the government has to and the, and the educational system. And uh, since the educational systems are one of the most conservative systems in the world because they have very, very long shelf life, and people that are trained certain way find it very hard to change the ways that that they operate. Um, my view is that uh, educational technology that's not going to replace the teachers, but going to augment them to some to to a large extent that the innovation will come from edutech, and the teachers will provide 
the 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 parts that teachers are good at and not so i'm that that's the part that i hope that will uh that will work um other parts i'm not sure thank you yes i mean i think we'll this we'll take this last question um because we've i think we might have texted you <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk and the <laughs> questions. I'm, my name is Amim. I'm a researcher here at the Middle East Institute. Um, I heard in one of your comments that you were talking about Finland as part of this coalition of small states that you're imagining. But also in the chart that you showed about the income disparities, Finland was actually very low on it. Fin Finland doesn't have... Um, so what, what's working for them? Why aren't the people on the Zeppelin in Finland just getting up and leaving the country? Why are they still staying there despite the fact that it's high taxes? Um, so that's one question. And the other question that I have is, um, you talk about governments taking risk, but governments have to go up on the ballot every four years or so. Um, and at the end of that cycle, they have to show some success. Um, so is that a sort of a natural um, disincentive to take risk because they have to be accountable to the ballot? Right. Um, uh, I'll start from the end. Um, Majority of governments in the world, democratic governments, are anti-strategic, precisely for that reason. But not only because of that, but because the electorate does not really value um, things that you do that will bring fruit much later on. Singapore is a, that's why I'm saying that Singapore is a, such an outlier in that space the thinking allowing this, I, I, I sometimes think about it as a long-term contract between the government and the electorate in Singapore, whereas the rest of the world works on very, very short contracts. And in short contracts, you cannot, in a long contract, you can do whatever you can do with short contract, but not vice versa. So this is definitely a big problem. There are many other problems, how the governments, because the, and it, it leads me to the second question, um, Majority of governments do not have the trust of their people. They, because, uh, and so the people are saying, okay, it's, it's basically a retail transaction. I'm gonna, ch I'm gonna elect you, you're gonna show me what you have done for me, and if you haven't done enough, I'm gonna replace you. So it's basically, if I didn't like the sandwich that you gave me, I'm gonna just, you know, bring, not, never come to, to, to your stand again. It's, uh, so I'm never going to cook something that takes a long time, and I'm gonna prepare a lot of small sandwiches and, and give them to you, and maybe you'll like some of them. So that's basically what we, what we have. Uh, and so governments are, are, are very problematic, and it's inherent, it's, it's again, it's a feature, it's not a bug. I mean, or, or you can think of it as a bug, but there's no way to, to correct it. Uh, going back to, to Finland, and it actually applies to Finland, Norway, well, Norway has this giant fund, so that's, uh, there's a augmenting, but Sweden, uh, Denmark. Um, all these countries were very, very antagonistic, uh, apart from them being Scandinavian countries and having sort of cultural tradition of consensus and, you know, sort of some kind of solidarity. They were very confrontational in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The marginal tax rates uh, in Sweden were driving people uh, out of the country in droves in the, in, the, in the 80s. All of these countries had a crisis, major financial and economic crisis in the late 80s and early 90s. And they all came out of that crisis with a very interesting idea that said we're all in the same boat, let's try to trust each other, and let's try to build a society that is not based on some uh, socialist idea of expropriation, but on, on joint responsibility for everything. So the unions and the, and the employers and the workers, and, the, and the, they all put their inputs and they agree. Okay, and in that, so that generates a completely different equilibrium than let's say Italy or, or, or Spain where it's much more we're going, to, we're going to take from you because you have and we don't have, etc. There is no conjoint. There's a, I call it Southern Europe syndrome versus Northern Europe syndrome. So there are two equilibria. And in one equilibrium, you can say, look, I'm willing to pay to, to live 
in a society which taxes me a lot, but it also gives me a lot of services. Because Finnish society gives me a lot of services, it makes my life very easy. So if I give up one, I'm going to give up another. So I don't necessarily want to leave. Some do leave, and there are lots of Finns working outside, which making a lot of money. But majority are actually happy with that. So the question, how do you move into that equilibrium? And so outside of Scandinavia, you have very few countries that have that. And so in those countries, if you start taxing the, the Zeppelin, I'm not saying that all of the Zeppelin is going to leave, but the Zeppelin has to have enough scale to sustain its structure. Because if you remove enough helium out of Zeppelin, it's just going to collapse, and then everybody leaves. So this is, I was talking, you're, you're absolutely right, there, there are another equilibrium, but it's maybe four or five countries in the world. The rest are in the, in the same model that I was talking about. Thank you. I'm just going to pass the mic to Minister because he has he wanted to ask a question or comment. Actually, I wasn't going to ask a question, but there were three questions which I thought merited uh, a response from the government side. The first from the the student. You know, you've I hope you've appreciated the point he's made that we are in the early phase of a revolution. And one lesson from history is that in the early phase, you actually get increased inequality. Your question, which is a very good question, how do we deal with it? And what Professor Candle is saying is that because we are a small country, and because fortunately we're one of the few AAA rated governments in the world, and because we have reserves, and because the amount of subsidies that we spend on education is amongst the highest in the world. But the, what we can do is we can uplift our standards of education, connect it with EduTech, so that what you will graduate with will be disproportionately higher than your peers in other parts of the world. So yes, there will still be inequality in Singapore, but you will be unequally endowed with more opportunities than your peers most other places in the world. So that's a key thing, education. But the other thing about education is what I said earlier. It used to be education is something you do before you go to work. Now it's because you will probably have two or three jobs. We need to keep educating you for your second job and your third job. And you can't wait till you're unemployed before you, you look for the next job. You, you get the skills for the next job. So that's why we talk about skills future. That's why we are focusing now. You know, every Singaporean now has $500 in the skills future, which they can use to pick any course that they want, which they hope, which we hope will be useful for your second or your third job. Okay, so education, education, education. The other question I want to respond to was on blockchain and cryptocurrency. You know, our prime minister is one of the few mathematicians who's a prime minister in the world. So he understands the mathematics of blockchain. He can also code, so he also understands the programming. In my frequent arguments with him, uh, he's often thrown the line at me. Blockchain technology is a solution looking for a problem. Think about it. It is a very good solution, but it's looking for the problem to solve, the right problem to solve. So the point is this, and I think Eugene has also made the same point. It is, a very, it is an important platform technology. I think it's going to be used, but we don't yet know which is the best use of this technology. It just so happens that cryptocurrencies is the sexy thing. Cryptocurrencies makes headlines, makes some investors apparently rich. So all the headlines are focused on that. So I think focus on the technology, look for the right use. As far as we in Singapore are concerned, you know we're one of a global financial center, and we have a very competent central bank. And the primary duty of a central bank is to deal or to avoid financial crisis. So by definition, central bankers everywhere have to be conservative. Now, having said that, 
you may also be aware we have got this concept called regulatory sandboxes, which means if you've got a new idea, a crazy idea, and it's a startup idea, even whether it's in cryptocurrency, fintech, or anything else, when you are starting up and you are therefore by definition not yet big enough to threaten the stability of the system, we let you operate in a regulatory sandbox. We don't put the whole weight of regulation on your shoulders. If you succeed and you grow big, then we will have to figure what to do about it. But that would be a problem of success. So in other words, we are still conservative, but we understand technology, we are open to experimentation, and we'll deal with the problems of success if and when we get there. And finally, on the political point, I mean, this is why I have to respond. Actually, politicians everywhere, not only in Singapore, everywhere, are not stupid. And actually, politicians everywhere know what is in the long-term interests of their country. Whether they're in opposition or in government, most politicians actually do. The problem for politicians in most places is they don't know how to do the right thing and win the next election. That's the tactical problem in Singapore, so far, in our short 54 years, we've been blessed. And again, Eugene Candle has made the right diagnosis. The key differentiator is trust. If there's trust, and again, business commentators will tell you, a, a high trust society has very low transaction costs. That load, lowered transaction cost allows us to be far more efficient, far more long, you know, long perspective, engage in long-term plans. I mean, Prime Minister's recent rally speech, he's talking about trying to make us climate-proof for the next century. Very few governments have the luxury and the wherewithal to think such long-term. The key ingredient is trust. As long as there's trust, you can think long term. And the election does not become a short term transaction. It's the difference between a marriage and a one night stand. And think about it. And the difference is in a marriage and build a future. Do you see the point? So in other words, the question then devolves into how do you build trust? And I think here it is a question of transparency, it's a question of record, what's your track record? And it's also a matter of leadership, that there is a vision, there is a credible plan, and the difference between leadership and management is that in leadership, it's not good enough to be right. You have to carry the people with you. Without that ability to mobilize, move, communicate, inspire, you will not move the population to make the appropriate long-term sacrifices and adjustment necessary. So anyway, this is the politics of a small place, of a people that have been hardworking, Discipline, law abiding, instinctively fair, and a people that have a stake in a society. I hope you don't mind me making these points. I'm not trying to be political, but I'm trying to give you a detached observation of the attributes of a political system that works. Thank you. Just uh, one point the minister mentioned early on uh, that, uh, you know, Israel is called startup nation, but if Israel is startup nation, then Singapore create a unicorn. <laughs> Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Kandel and Minister Balakrishnan for this very interesting afternoon. <laughs>